All right, everybody, we got 10 minutes here with Mr. Ryan Muckenhern, and we've got some stuff between Ryan, Mark, and myself on the table here. We are going to talk a bit about cartridges and some uh, some reloading stuff. Um, this is for all you folks out there who are brass rats on the range, thinking about becoming a brass rat. You're looking around for that 223 brass to be reloading and today's crazy day and age of, uh, of ammo and reloading components, shortages everywhere. Um, Ryan, I think the question here is, let's say you're finding that particularly dirty, beat up, basically just, I mean, everybody else sees it as junk. What I call garbage pail brass. Garbage pail brass. Oh, you got a whole pail right there. <clears throat> when it looks like um, you swept it off of a gravel floor. Because you probably gonna... you picked it off one. Correct. There's even, in this container, I have uh, little bits of grass. <laughs> um, here's a 9 millimeter case. So, yeah, uh, reloading is tough right now. Ammo's tough right now. A lot of stuff's tough right now. Um, but if you still like to shoot and you find yourself going to these um, you know, public ranges or you're getting brass from law enforcement agencies, um, you're picking up all the bulk stuff. Um, a lot of it is in a state of disrepair um, and may even be able to, like, may be difficult to reload just due to kind of the mechanisms um, right. employed with bulk ammunition. Right, like it might be the military stuff with Correct. crimped primer pockets. Is which, that what it is? Which is why we are here today. Well, I'll say this. We're talking about this in the context of like today's kind of tough ammo times, but way before this, I mean, you always see dudes at the range walking around, head down, hands oh, yeah. behind their back. Scanning, searching, and then I, I some of the stuff I see them pick up, I'm like, impossible. it looks like a crustacean, like it's got yeah. barnacles growing out of it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So let's uh, let's hear what you got here, Ryan. Now, so, so I am I am that brass rat. You are, Ryan. admittedly. Um, so if you're like me and you've got a bunch of brass in a state of disrepair, and specifically these crimped primer pockets, right. um, which will stop your press dead in its tracks. Um, you'll destroy primers potentially. You could even set one off if you weren't careful. Can you um, explain what that is with a crimp primer pocket and how to uh, how to identify it? So yes. we'll find one and put a picture up um, that isn't um, totally crusted over, so you can see it. But uh, basically, in the production of um, especially military uh, or law enforcement ammunition or bulk ammo, um, the pocket of the primer after everything is seated in there, a special tool kisses it. Um, so that it's got this little crimp. Keeps the primer from backing out under the rest of full auto fire or transport, long-term storage, et cetera. Just kind of like an added level of um, safety for containment of that primer. And you can knock the primers out fairly easily. They're a little bit harder to knock out than a non-staked or crimped primer, but getting a new primer in the pocket is kind of where the, the problem begins. Um, so once it's knocked out, you have to get rid of that to make that brass pretty usable. Um, you could seat a primer through a, st a staked or crimped primer pocket, but it's you're probably going to deform your primer, possibly destroy your primer, maybe jam up your press, especially if you're on a progressive. Um, and then that that's very frustrating and really kind of dissuasive and why a lot of people don't like keep this kind of brass. They'll just chuck it. Um, there's a couple different ways to remove that crimp. It's actually really simple. Um, and you can take brass that looks like garbage and turn it into something that looks usable um, and is usable in a short amount of time. Few few components you need, not super expensive, um, and differing degrees. Like you can do this very manually or you can do it somewhat automated, which we'll illustrate here today. All right. So well, these ones still have the primers in them. So they do. you would have to knock that out first. You would. Um, and Are these crimped or uncrimped? These are, all these here are crimped. They are. Okay. Yeah. So they look like crap. Um, straightforward. Yes. They're they're crusty. They're nasty. Um, through the power of the internet and editing, I have some that have been decapped and cleaned. Look at you, Rachel Ray. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so a, a really useful tool in this process of production is what is called a universal decap die, which we have here. Um, this one is made by Lee. They're very inexpensive. Their only task and function is simply decapping the primer, so knocking the primer out. It doesn't reshape the case. It doesn't resize anything. Um, the case mouth stays exactly the same. Um, 
So this die's only function is knocking the primer out. And if you're going to be picking up brass like this that's cruddy and crappy, the way I personally like to do it is using a universal decapping die um, because it doesn't interfere or interact with the case, the case mouth in any way, shape, or form, just punches the primer out. You can take brass that looks like garbage and run it through this die, one, without hurting the die, two, without hurting the brass, um, get the primer out, and then get it to the cleaning stage, uh, which is something I'm going to touch on here in a little bit. So these cases were wet tumbled for one hour last night. Okay. Um, so I've got a Frankfurt Arsenal stainless steel media tumbler um, that I put a teeny little bit of Dawn dish soap, a little bit of Lemmy Shine. I left the Lemmy Shine out last night because I was in a hurry. Um, but I had some Dawn dish soap in it uh, and these little stainless steel pins. And they go over and scrape all the junk off the brass. So it looks like brass again instead of like uh, something you'd find at the Titanic site. Yeah, yeah. Um, so they've been decapped. They're still crimped. They've been cleaned. Um, now we can decrimp them. There's a couple of tools that you can get, press-mounted or individual tools that are primer pocket swagers, um, which some folks will tell you is the preferred method of removing this crimp. So instead of actually cutting material out, we're just pushing material away. Hmm, okay. There is a benefit to it. Um, you, you can't really over-open the pocket, so to speak, or not as easily anyways with these swaging tools. They're a little more finicky to use. Um, the really popular ones from Dylan. The case actually goes over a mandrel. Then that's flipped down, and then you use a little, like a ram arm, if you will, that pushes it up against a button and just pushes that material out of the way. Hmm. Um, so I've got one of those. Uh, I also have a CH4D um, ram mounted, like a press mounted um, decrimper. Works in effectively the same means, only it uses a shell holder, which we have here. It goes like this. And then a little stem comes up and kisses the bottom of that and, and punches it out of the way. You got to be a little more careful with those because you can break your shell holders if you put too much force on it, um, which is kind of why I've gone away from those two and just go to the uh, like the cutting of that primer pocket. Um, so with limited tools, you can do this. We've got a power station here. You can also do this with, with one of the very simple little hand tools as well. Yeah. I used to do that as well. So they, you've got all these little accessories up here on this power station. They'll also hook into the little hand tools that look like a screwdriver handle. Um, so we've got a primer pocket uniformer. We've got a um, primer pocket cleaner, or excuse me, cutter. This is actually what's going to cut that crimp out. And then a primer pocket scraper, which is going to get rid of any additional crud. The critical one to focus on is the uh, primer pocket cutter. Uh, the uniform will help as well later, but if you were going to do this in order of operations, it really should go cutter, um, uniformer, and then scraper. Uh, so I don't know why I set them up that way, but yeah, yeah, this is uh, normally you put a lot of thought into this order of operations. <laughs> I had like four minutes. <laughs> I feel bad. Yeah, that's all right. Um, so if you if you don't have a power station, no big deal. You're gonna you're gonna just use a little hand tool, and all we're gonna do, and we can flip this power station on to show you how quick this one will go. So when it's engaged. Just take the case. Again, the primer has been knocked out of that pocket. And you're going to set it on there, and you're going to feel this resistance real quick. And all of a sudden, it's slack. And if you look on the on the back side of the case now, you can see there's a little chamfer. Mm. That's yeah. there. So it cut that crimp out. So the uh, the um, the crimp is more up high. Mm -hmm. It's it's not like it goes all the way down to the to the very bottom of the primer pocket. It's no. Just, it's just pretty up. Really just on the edge of, of like... The transition between the case head, where all the text is usually uh, stamped into, and then the uh, primer pocket itself. Okay. So that crimp comes out real, real quick. Uh, like that was a three-second operation. I then go in there, I uniform that up a little bit, cleans up a little bit of the sidewalls, and then I scrape out the crud on the inside, and we have a really clean, uniform primer pocket. Sure enough, it's beautiful. Yeah. So here, this is this case is a really good example. This is a, a federal case. This one was minted in 2005. You can see the crimp is really prevalent there. Let me see that. So you, is, you see like the, the primer pocket itself, and then just out of the primer pocket on the case head, there's that extra little rim. Mm, okay. Yep. So go ahead, it's Mark. Not, it's not what I was assuming that I'd see. I was I was picturing a, a single stake that, like you see on the top of a bolt carrier yep, group or something. That exists too. Uh, I see those more on larger cases like 50 BMG. I've got a bunch of 50 BMG Lake City brass that has four stakes that actually flow material over the top of the primer, like a mechanical lock. Okay. Um, 
This is a, a bit more common on 9mm 45, 223, 308. Can Got I see it. the one where we removed it? Yeah. yeah. There you go. It's... It's subtle. It's it's very subtle. It's almost like we're just chamfering the outside of that. It is. It is. It's it, it's almost like going from a hard edge mm-hmm. to to that bevel, yep. sort of so to speak. Okay. Okay. So Mark, we'll get a close up photo for you guys over yeah. on uh, over on the Instagram. Let it's us know. Where uh, you need one. Let, let us it go. Know you I want see. you to grab that federal cartridge case. All right, here. Let me uh, figure out which one I need to hand to you, Mark. Okay. Actually, I can kind of tell. Here, this one is the one that is uh, crimped. Give it a go, Mark. This thing's pretty handy. This little power station here. Super handy. Okay. So we're going here first. Yep. Who's it, whose is this? This uh, is Ryan? a Lyman. A Lyman? Yep. It's got five stations on it. How yep. careful do I need to be like getting it completely vertical? Uh, not very. I mean, you'll you'll feel the resistance when it goes down on there. Oh, boy. So you can hear that load, and then it'll lighten up. So it should feel different in your hands. Yeah. Okay. Now flip it over. Take a look at it. You see it's been beveled. Yeah. You see that fresh brass there. Yep. Now hit it with this pocket uniformer. It, it grabbed a lot more. Like it grabbed a lot more than I thought. I was yeah, like, "Oh, you got to kind of hold on to that thing." Pretty aggressive little crimp there. So down on there. Okay, all the way down. Yep. yep. Okay, bam. You can feel that vibration kind of change. Take it off, and then put it on the scraper. And all that scraper is going to do is get the the crud out of the backside up by the flash hole. Pull that over, and let's take an inspection. Oh, do, Ryan. Likes crud that's a good looking, I'll hole. tell you, that's a good looking primer pocket right there. Nice chamfer and deburr on there. No chips, no gouges. Good, clean, uniform pocket. Way to go, Mark. That's nice. We did it, everybody. Now, is this one crimped? By gosh, that one's already been done. That, I, I missed Aha, that one. Here's, here's I was a, right. So, a, Ryan, I you, thought it didn't <clears> look crimped. You, you may have covered this earlier and I missed it. But so, looking at this case yeah. that does not have the primer removed. Yeah. How how would I look at this and go, mm, so, yep, I'm going to need to go through this process. Yeah, so when we look at this, you can see there's the, the primer itself, mm-hmm. and then you've got the primer pocket around it, and then just out from that is like another ring. Um, so like rings around Saturn, um, that, that secondary ring is present there. Okay. I think I see what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And you'll feel it too on your reloading press when you're running that up into the die. Crimped cases require a little bit more resistance to get that primer out. Okay. Whereas a non-crimp case, um, assuming the primer pocket sized well, uh, or it hasn't stretched anyways, oh, it's just very minor resistance. There's a fair amount of material on that thing. Now, hey, also, so speaking to that, do you need to be cognizant of like, oh, we got to pull some of that off? You don't have to. When you're doing them, no. What do you do if like, uh, notice when you look down in the primer pocket there through the little hole that goes mm-hmm. into the, the volume of the case, there's, there's a bit of debris there from some... Cutting of the brass. Sure. See how that made it in there? Yep. Now so you just got to blow that out or something? With or? with that, you can get a uh, flash hole tuner, which is like a, a smaller version of this thing, only okay. it's a small stem, and it, it'll recut that flash hole or, or just kind of edge break it. Um, so what I would actually do, and I'm going to power this down. I think we're good with this exercise now. Um, it's it's kind of a nice white noise. It is. Yeah, it wasn't bothering me at all. <laughs> so what I would personally do after having done this step, now I know I've already cleaned my brass one time, but I'm going to do it again. Okay. Uh, so after this part is done and the, the cases are, are processed in the, in the sense that the primer pocket crimp has been cut out, these, depending on if there is a bunch of crud in there, are either going to go right through the resizing die with no decapping stem in place, reshaped, and then chucked back into my tumbler and cleaned. Or I'm going to chuck them into the tumbler, get them extra clean, get all the little shavings out, and then go through the resize function. Why even clean them before doing uh, the decrimping? You don't have to. Um, There's a lot of junk. So like if we were to just decap one of these dirty cases right now, that primer pocket's going to look like hell. There's no reason that you necessarily have to do it. Um, so it's probably just nicer on your equipment. Yeah, maybe. I mean, there's a lot of garbage and junk in there and carbon and, and a lot of these cases, you know, you can see that one sat on a water line for a while. It was mm-hmm. on an outdoor range and I just picked it up. It's a, you know, I refer to it as a skull component. It's just something I do in my head that makes it seem like it's a better part of the process. Uh, really up to you when, when I'm doing de- like 
decapping and, and cutting of these primer pockets, I'm usually doing them in large quantities. Got it. Um, so I just stage it. So I'll, I'll give them a quick cleaning. And, and even the wet tumbling is probably excessive. Washing these in your sink would be okay too. Like put them in one of those gym bags. It's got a hole in it and just kind of shake them around, get some of that material out of there. Um, that's fine too. Uh, but this is just the way I do it. I mean, it makes, to me, like looking at because those are pretty dirty, then you're kind of like, okay, now I know what I'm working with. Yep. Like you said, it keeps your stuff clean. I did have a question. One of these cases, I don't know if it's this one here, had a little bit of a, uh, like a crease yeah, in, little, the, in the case wall there. Yep. So likely fired out an AR-15 um, or hit a rock. One of the two. If it's fired out of an AR, the brass deflector can sometimes kiss the case bodies or the case mouths a little bit. Um, not uncommon. Uh you know, do a visual inspection on them. If they've been on the range and they've been stepped on and they've got some big dents, then that one gets thrown into the scrap bucket. But um, these are all, you know, good to go. Okay. Uh, it's another element to the cleaning thing. So after they've been cleaned a little bit, before I invest a bunch of time in them, like I can look at this case and be like, okay, neck's not split. There's no big gouge marks, ding marks. Right. Oh, uh, yeah. It's worth right. doing more work on. <laughs> right. Okay. Good stuff. Um, so if you do this manually... And let's say you didn't want to invest in these little $7 pieces here because they really aren't that expensive. This is a VLD deburring tool um, that we have on the power station right now. This would be more appropriate for, you know, cutting case mouths for, you know, like a slippery profile or a boat tail bullet. Uh, the non-VLD non -ver non version of that, when I, when I first started doing this, I would use that to cut the primer pockets. Oh. It, it accomplishes the same thing. We just go around and we just trim it out. Okay. Like that. Nice. And the non-VLD version works better than the VLD version because the VLD version might go deeper into the pocket. The non-VLD will just knock it right out. Good to know. These are the things, for those listening, not seeing it, they kind of look like uh, they look like the things that uh, pull trees out of the ground or plant trees or whatever it is. Isn't that what that kind of looks like? Yeah. Like, like those thing big that, machines. Uh, sure. Digs out caves. Yes. Tunnels. Um, cool. All right. Well... Another thing I feel like we should throw out there is if anybody goes to sleep at night with white noise, perhaps they want us to put up on Spotify Vortex's own white noise soundtrack of just uh, Primer Pocket. I was going to say, I, you know, you shut it off. I, I like it. It kind of covered up the ring in my <laughs> ears. There oh, we go. There, the ring's See that? Gone. And then Excellent. just the occasional. Ryan, if you, if, like you, that. if you are a brass rat or you're thinking about or becoming a brass rat. Don't you dare rat, take this to 20 minutes. I won't. Is this something, does this kind of give you a leg up? Are a lot of people leaving these because they kind of do require these extra steps? So if you're willing to go through the process, you're going to be able to get your, like other things might disappear first perhaps? Yeah, um, I have seen that over the years, absolutely, where they'll be picking up uh, the brass and they look at it like, nope, crimped, they chuck it. Yeah, okay. And it's somewhat wasteful because now, like I think that whole process that I just did there was sub 10 seconds. And that's yeah. a, that's yeah, that was a not a big deal. Completely usable piece of brass now, so spectacularly simple. Um, and now it's it's functional, ready to be reloaded safely. I'm not going to have to worry about rune and primers, which are also in a shortage right now. Um, and this this becomes infinitely easier. That one had a big hook on it. Beauty. That's it, folks. There you have it, reloaders and prospective reloaders. If you have any questions about this sort of stuff, always let us know in the comments below if you're watching on YouTube or over on Instagram. Like we said, we're also going to have a little comparison of, uh, of one of these that has been decrimped versus uh, crimped. You should check it out. Let us know which one you think is which. All right. We will see you on the next one otherwise. Bye, everybody. See Bye, you. everybody. You can't stop, can you? You can't okay, stop. Look at it. that. Just get that I white noise in there. So much. <laughs> It's actually just creating some weird feedback buzz when you got <laughs> close to it. Oh, this is a good one. When I put it damn near pulled it out of my hand. Need to work on my grip strength. Yeah, I think Martin, you might need to. Look at this. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. what happened there, Jim? I was trying not to run into Ryan's hand. Oh, okay. Well, kind but of what he did a little bit. <laughs> what happens if you just leave it on this too long? It'll overcut it. Overcut oh, it? Oh, really? Yeah. So, like, that's overcut, right? I just purposely left it on there probably too long. Somebody's probably going to scream at me for wasting. Well, don't put it back on if you want. Well, I'm just I curious what about, overcut looks like. I have about 70,000 of these. 
about 255 gallon drums. Of what, once fired or something? Once fired, 223, 9mm, 45, 3 Mixed. So I just, I like, for example, I actually left this thing on the cutter for quite some time, but like, how's that? Probably reloadable. Probably reloadable? Yeah. So in that case, Like, that how sense, would you find out that it's not? You'd know when you went to see the primer. It would just kind of... Yeah, like there's no resistance like this. Well, that's kind of nice, because in that sense, it's... It's not idiot proof, but it seems like it's hard to. Pretty hard to. Do you right. don't have to be like, eh, ah, I did it wrong. Eh, eh, you know, I mean, yeah. From garbage to gold. Well, you're not gonna find out you did it wrong, you know, when you shoot the damn thing. We hopefully. gotta find a uh, crimped one and then a, a deep.